At Streaming Media West, Brian Ring, what's the panel you officiated here today? Two subjects, uh, one in sponsor integration, the other in sports betting. And so yeah, we, had, we had some experts here from the legal side. We went through how um, sports betting is going to be a state by state, how important honorable data is, the difference between parimutuel and, and booked wagers. So that was super interesting. We had Rich Robinson from the World Surf League. He talked about um, the way that betting was uh, going on in surfing in Australia and also some of the challenges associated with, um, with, with betting. Uh, but also he mentioned that the, the sort of middle step for him was viewer engagement and fan engagement. And so um, that was an important element of his world, what was it, see, um, the Freshwater Pro. There's a, a, an artificial surf camp in the middle of California that they're using to essentially run new competitions. And they have a, a fantastic viewer engagement test during that event where they basically got fans to rate the competitions. One of the things about surfing that's difficult with respect to betting is the fact that it's a subjective sport. And so you get viewers involved then you can sort of crowdsource the data around how, how that surfer did, and that brings some quasi-objectivity to it. We talked about the importance of low latency and or synchronized latency uh, for all of these, whether it's sponsor integrations, interactivities, or especially betting, where you need to have low latency feeds in order for those to be uh, f have high fidelity and, and work properly. Um, and then we also had another section about sponsorship integration, and we had Scott Sonnenberg from the LA Clippers, we had Darcy Lawrence from uh, uh, eTorque Sports. I hope I got that right. And then we also had um, uh, Felix uh, LaHaye, I believe is his name, from United Esports. Um, and those guys talked about some interesting stuff too. Clipper Court Vision is a tool, um, sorry, an experience that Clippers offers to its fans. Steve Ballmer came in. He owns the Clippers. He bought them five years ago. He saw an amazing set of data that the basketball operations team had and had this vision of can we can we bring AR, augmented reality, bring that data into the game and, and visualize it in the broadcast, <clears throat> that migrated into, I think, a very important, uh, basically a watershed moment in sports video broadcasting, which is the Clipper Court Vision experience is a personalized experience in the sense that you get to choose the camera angles, you get to choose the audio commentary, there are different graphical overlays that you can choose, such as mascot mode, uh, stati you know, statistics or betting mode, coaches mode. Uh, so that was fantastic. And uh, Darcy talked about automotive, uh, car racing, how the digital uh, versions of these competitions, video game competitions for racing, were turning into f real physical racers, right, that they get into the car and can actually uh, succeed on the track. Um, and then finally, I think Felix ha had some really great insights, uh, number one, about how um, people talk about Twitch and esports as having sponsor integration possibilities that are endemic or non-endemic. And he made the good point that a non-endemic brand that executes really well is going to become an endemic brand. It becomes part of the lifestyle and the culture. And so what, that what does it mean, endemic? Endemic is that if you're in video games, you have people that want to reach video gamers with video games, equipment, steering wheels, you know, seat, seats. So, so those are things that are part of the hobby itself. And so the idea of an endemic brand is you're only reaching those hobbyists, if you will, and all major brands want to reach a wider audience if they can. And so the idea that Bud Light would come in and advertise in an esports uh, competition was, as, as Felix put it, a sort of watershed event. It shows that um, they can do legal, um, uh, follow the legal drinking age rules with respect to sponsorship. Um, it also showed that there's a broader audience than just kids. And so that that, that is the idea of, you know, basically any brand that you might find at a grocery store being able to come into this world of esports and be considered a credible, you know, have street cred and, and really reach that audience. What opportunities are there for, um, for betting in states which have uh, betting on sports which are legal there during the times that there are not, are not pro sports or college sports events going on. In other words, those OTT offer opportunities for betting on sports which are not traditional uh, major league or pro league betting events. Uh, I, I think, I don't know if I have the, an exact answer to that question. I, I don't think that, um, I mean, first of all, 
there's a million of everything, so there's all kinds of experimentation going on. But I think the, the answer I would give is, and I'm not sure that you could bet on a game that's not happening. I think a lot of the energy around sports betting is the game that's happening, and in fact, betting that's happening inside the game, what's going to happen next in the game. However, I think fantasy in general is the type of activity that is sort of between games. And so those sort of predict, uh, the, the, sorry, so those sort of um, the daily fantasy or the fantasy types of, of experiences, um, I think have some capability of, of, of bringing fans and retaining them post-game and pre-game. But I think the bulk of the bet, bet, betting activity, the, the quote-unquote real betting activity of sports betting will be uh, associated with the games themselves. How about esports as betting opportunities? Would that be for uh, contestants to bet on themselves or for audience to bet as well? Yeah, no, I think that's a great, no, I think that's for audience. Um, we didn't talk about specifically esports betting, but I'm sure it will exist. But I will say our betting expert mentioned the idea that uh, bet, bet, betting does bring new crowds to games, right? It exposes lots of people that may be into the betting side, but not the, the game side, to then be exposed and learn. And once you do that, you can begin to enjoy and appreciate the game, I think, a little bit more. And so we talked about those types of, of relationships. Is there anything technical about uh, OTT? Uh, that uh, uh, creates a, uh, an enhanced betting opportunity for any sport? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think so. I mean, I think in the following sense, uh, when, when we, and we know this now, that a lot of people are watching from mobile devices. Um, I think typically the idea is that if you have a big screen and you're na near it, that's the best screen to go to. However, we are becoming a more sort of personalized type of viewer, in which case, you know, I found myself, for example, watching a lot of mobile video because, you know, it's late at night. I don't want to wake up my daughter who, you know, is in the room next to the TV. All of a sudden, I'm watching a lot of mobile. So the more that you have people on mobile devices, the more e the easier it is to incorporate overlays that actually have have the data uh, that's necessary to make the bets or present the bets to the viewers, to present data about the bets to the viewers. And so I do think that mobile experience, especially for companies that have the uh, wherewithal and the capability to build their own apps and their own players, we are going to see more, I think, of that kind of betting you know, and or quasi-betting type of activity on devices. Yeah. Anything else you want to say? Uh, no, thank you for okay. offering me the opportunity. It was great to be here.